All right, good morning, church. I'm glad you guys braved the snow and the roads and, and you're here. Um, I'm glad that you guys are here because I was like, man, I just didn't know. And, and in my spirit, I just felt like either this place is going to be popping with many people or it's going to be popping with three, four people. And either ways, I know that's going to be popping because uh, it's going to be happening. It's, it's going to be wild. It's going to be crazy because... Uh, where the, presence of the God, of, where the presence of God is, it's always happening. It's always hot. It's great. Even I need to layer up with three hoodies. Would you please stand with me? And um, we are going to praise God this morning. Um, not out of obligation. We're not going to praise God because we feel... Because we feel... Uh, you know, forced to fear out of fear. Uh, we're going to praise God because He's worthy of our praise. And uh, we're going to praise Him in such a way that He reveals more of His awesomeness to us. Uh, I want you to participate in a very different way this morning. I'm going to read a psalm. And, and before I even start reading, I want you to, to think about the things that you've been praying for for breakthrough. Sometimes I feel like I'm talking to a wall because uh, I do not know who God's talking to, but I know for a fact that God wants to speak to some of you this morning. And, and yesterday when I posted on social media too, what if this was the week you've been praying for when God pours out his perfect love that casts out fear? And this morning, I want you to participate with me. I want you to think about those areas where you've been praying for a breakthrough. And if you had a bulletin, you have a pen nearby, I want you to write that down this morning. And we're going we're gonna to use that in our participation, in our time of worship. Because like I said, what the presence of, the, of God is, man, that's, that's some beauty in that place. That's some freedom in that place. And God does not want his children to live in, in, in bondage, in whatever bondage it can be. Uh, God wants to bring us into a place of freedom. And we're going to sing some songs about freedom. We're going to sing some songs about God being awesome. And I want you to write that down. I mean this. I'm not just saying like, okay, write it down, bring it next week. Now I'm talking about now. Uh, I, want, I want God to bring that freedom now. And, and then when we're singing those songs where God's like, raise that up to me because I want to hear your prayer. I want to bring a breakthrough. I want us to raise that in worship, in, in an act of faith. Um, and so I'm going to read this psalm, and I want your pens to start moving in those areas of breakthrough. Um, there are some things that I've written, and, um, and unfortunately I won't be able to stop playing and raise it up, but I'm praying for breakthrough in, in families that are around the world that have been reaching out to me, and there's nothing that I can do. My hands are tied. I cannot travel to those people. Uh, the least I could do is talk to them over the phone, but there's someone that I can talk to that's far better than me talking to them, and his name is Jesus, and I'm praying for a breakthrough. I'm praying for healing. I'm praying for restoration in homes and in families and in marriages. I'm praying that this church will find revival once again, that once again we'll smell the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit, that once again we'll see breakthrough like never before in our lives, in our children's lives, in our grandchildren's lives. I'm praying for provision in areas where we need his provision. So I hope your pens will get moving while I, while I read this psalm. Um, this is a song that we're going we're to start in faith. We're going to walk this morning out in faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, the word of God says. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Hallelujah. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, play something for me over there, man. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Father, I pray for a breakthrough in the area of fear this morning in the name of Jesus. The war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I've asked of the Lord, that will I seek after. And this morning, Living Church, let's seek after this. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. In other words, to be in his sweet, holy, good, full presence of God. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. Let's hear it. Thank you, Jesus. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry out loud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You've said, seek my face. And my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. 
Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not. O God of my salvation, for my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your ways, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen up against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe, and I hope you do too, that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait, I say, on the Lord. God is awesome. My God is awesome. He heals me when I'm broken. He heals me when I'm broken. It's strange where I've been weak. Strange where I've been weak. Forever. Forever. My God is awesome. My God is awesome. Sing awesome. He's awesome. So awesome. My God is awesome. So so awesome. My God is awesome. Sing awesome. My God. So awesome. Oh, he's awesome. Sing it like you mean it. My God is awesome. Oh, my God is awesome. My God is awesome. Savior of the whole world. Savior of the world. Giver of salvation. Giver of salvation. By his stripes I claim. My God is awesome. My God is awesome. Today I am forgiven. My God is awesome. Let's raise your voice. He's awesome. My God is awesome. So awesome. Oh, he's awesome. He can move the mountains. Jesus, you're awesome. So awesome. Forever awesome. Let's kick it up a notch. My God is mighty. My God is mighty. Do you believe it? Yes, he's mighty. Oh, he's mighty. So mighty. My God is mighty. So mighty. My God is mighty. Our God is holy. Our God is holy. It's not like Him. Oh, he's, holy. he's set apart, unique, and different. My God is holy. His name is Jesus. My God is holy. My God is mighty. He's a provider. He's my provider. You're my provider. My he God. My My healer, he is my healer. My healer, my healer, my healer, my healer, my healer. provider, 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 provider. Has he provided for you? Provider, let's sing protector. Protector, my protector, protector, let hell know my protector, my protector, he's awesome, he's awesome. my God is awesome, he can move the mountains, keep me in the valley, 
hide me from the rain my God is awesome He heals me when I'm broken A strength where I've been weakened Forever He will reign One more time My God is awesome Lift your voices He's awesome Yes He is He's awesome He's awesome. Is he awesome? My God is awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. And Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. And Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Sing Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. You silence oh, let's call on his name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Peace, we'll bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break. At your name and still, or call the sea to still, this rage in me to still every way. At your name we call you, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Breathe and call these bones to live and call these lungs to sing once again. I will praise in Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, oh, sing Jesus, 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 you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Silence fear, oh Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, we invite you to make Jesus come. Your name, it is a light that the shadows can deny, and your name, it cannot be
Take away the memories, Lord. Silence it, Lord. Shh. Be quiet. Be still. Be still. Oh, just like how you woke up in the boat and rebuked the storm and rebuked the waves. I pray, Lord, that you would rebuke the forces of evil against us. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. The weapon may be there pointed at you, but it would not prosper. Don't fear. Don't fear. Don't fear. His name is alive. His name is alive. And it forever will be lifted high. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, I pray for a breakthrough in those areas where people are coming, your children are coming in faith, yeah. saying, maybe today is the day. Maybe today is the day. Finally, today is the day when you would say, hey, Lazarus, come forth. And what was dead, you bring it to life. And what we've been bring, trying to revive to life, you will put it to death finally. Maybe today is the day where your perfect love will cast out that fear. In Jesus' name, I pray that it would happen this morning, my King. I pray that it would happen this morning. I pray that it would happen right now. I pray that if this is all we came for, let it happen right now. Let it happen right now. Let your kingdom come now. Let your will be done now. I'm gonna see your victory. I'm gonna see your victory. For the battle belongs to you. Lord, I'm gonna see your victory, yes I'm gonna see your victory, for the battle belongs to you Lord, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna see your victory, yes I'm gonna see your victory, why is that? For the battle belongs to you Lord, oh let's sing it in faith, I'm gonna see your victory. Do you believe it? Yes, I'm gonna see your victory. Cause the battle belongs to you, Lord. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. The God I serve knows only how to triumph Oh my God will never fail Did you hear me? Oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see your victory I'm gonna see your victory For the battle For the battle Oh, we certainly are in a battle, aren't we? I'm gonna see a victory. Thank you, Jesus. I'm gonna see a victory. The battle belongs to you, Lord. There is power in the mighty name of Jesus. In every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giants, oh no Cause I know how this story ends Oh, I know how this story ends And I'm gonna see a victory And I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord
Your victory for this battle belongs to Yeshua, to you. I'm gonna see your victory. I'm gonna see your victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. All around the world, all around the world, all around the world, there are evil forces that are trying to tear down the works of God, that's trying to tear down the people of God. But the battle belongs to the Lord. And this morning in your homes, this morning in your spirit, this morning in your mind, the battle belongs to the Lord. Whose battle is it? It's the Lord's. And when you give your life to Him, when you give your battles to Him, He always will bring home the victory. And you're going to celebrate in the freedom this morning, not being worried about the weapons that's pointed against to you oh who am I talking to you this morning man you got to wake up you got to sing in faith because the battle belongs to the Lord you might have to go back home to a sick loved one you might have to go back home to a broken world but the battle belongs to the Lord. I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord Oh, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you. Our God is awesome, isn't he? Oh, yes, he's awesome, and only he is. He's awesome. He's awesome. Sing, my God is awesome. Sing it from the bottom of your heart. He's awesome. Only He. He's awesome. He's awesome. Oh, come on. He's awesome over every area of fear. He's awesome over my sickness. He's awesome over my worries. He's awesome. He should take the rightful place. He's awesome and no one else is. He's awesome, He's awesome not even my sin. Awesome. Only He. He's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. My God is awesome. He can move the mountains and keep me in the valley. He can hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. He heals me when I'm broken. Thank you. Strength where I've been weak. And somebody ought to praise His holy name. Is that how you guys praise in America? Is that how you praise the true and the living God in the living church? Is that how you praise that God is worthy to be praised? Is that how you praise a God who's your light and your salvation? Who says, who can you fear? I'm with you. Oh, come on, we can do better than that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You see, typically what I see in churches, typically what I see in religion, typically what I see in worship groups and teams is people trying to stir people up into a frenzy. Dear God, forgive me if I come across that way this morning. You see, the reason why I'm so fired up is because I've been in the furnace all week and the Word of God has been giving me so much strength this morning. The Word of God has been bringing me through this morning and I'm here not because I've been eating healthy. I'm here because the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And I believe that in this room there are some of you who are in the furnace and how can I if God's walked me through how can I be silent of such greater salvation oh man I'd be a liar if I stood here and just try to stir you into a frenzy I don't care what you think about me at homes so or you watch me around the world but boy I'm alive because of Jesus and if you are dead he's calling you to life this morning and you might be a blood-bought born-again believer that's carrying your heavy yoke and burden of sin oh my god 
Oh, my God is awesome. He can move the mountains, man. If he can move mountains, he can move your burdens. So I pray this in the name of Jesus in faith and the church say amen if you believe it. Amen. We're not done. I'm going to come back with a word. So get ready, get a breather. I'm going to try and rest my voice. All right? Continue praising God. Ministry is going to happen over here. Angels are going to minister to you. They're going to come and pray for healing and breakthrough and salvation. The Word of God says that the angels are ministering spirits sent to those who are to receive salvation. Who's here this morning who needs Yeshua like never before? Ah, oh, Lord, I need you. So go ahead. Love people. Love what God's doing and we'll be back. What's up, Living Church Boise? I'm Levi, and I'm going to give you a couple announcements. So first off, welcome to church. I'm so glad you're here. If you stayed at home today because you didn't want to brave the icy roads, then totally fine. If you're home for other reasons, totally fine. I'm just glad that you're here with us right now. Um, again, couple announcements. First off, share this message. Do it out of faith that God will move. Do it to really act out uh, out of knowing what God can do in this. And so share the message, like the message, uh, get it out to your friends, be an evangelist while you're at home. That will be fantastic. Uh, if you'd like to give in tithes and offerings, we'll be, bring up a slide later. You can do that through our app. You can find that at the Living Church Boise on any of the app stores, or you can go to our website, thelivingchurchboise.com where you can give online over there. Again, we'll put up a slide, has mailing information if you want to go with that option. A uh, couple other things. If you are getting a little bit of cabin fever and you want to be a part of a life group, we have those. So again, get our app. You can find a life group or you can find a community to talk about the sermon midweek and it will uh, be really good. Um, one last thing. We just finished a series called What Happens After I Die. And if you would, uh, if you were blessed by the series or it was a life transformation series, we'd love to hear from you. So go ahead and send us an email. It'll be again at thelivingchurchboise at gmail.com. Send us an email to that link. And in that, just say, uh, just write out what, uh, what, uh, what your testimony is from that series in particular. What breakthrough did God give you? Uh, we will be giving out a free shirt, a free hat. Specify what you want. Uh, we'll randomly pick a person to get one. And, uh, and then if you win by random, we'll send it to you. So again, send us an email if you want to do that. Right now, we're going to take about a three-minute break before we're going to hear some house announcements for the whole church family. And then Joel will bring, be bringing the word on not a new series, but a new message that he felt would be right for all of you. Okay, we'll play some music and we'll be back soon. Again, and I will praise, oh Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, oh Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus.
If you could please stop being so friendly to each other and pay attention to me, that'd be great. Now, we are going to continue our time of worship this morning by giving tithes and offering. And um, we were talking about this with our kids the other day, that worship is giving worth to God and showing that he's worthy. And we did that with our through song, and now we're going to do it with our finances. Um, and it's a great way to say, God, I invite you into every area of my life, and I trust you, and I want to obey you, and, um, and you are worth more to me than, than what you've already given me. I'll give some of it back to you. So um, let's pray real quick, and then we'll get on to our announcements. So Father, we come in agreement today. God, we agree that you are a good God who gives good gifts to his children. Lord, you are awesome, and you are capable of moving mountains. Be glorified today, Father, in the way that we give of our emotions this morning, of our intellect, God, of our finances, of ourselves. God, have all of us today. Let us leave changed today. Let your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to be here today. Jesus, be glorified. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um, last week, Coral shared about a few um, needs that we have around the church just for upkeep of the building inside and out. Um, so if that's a, a way that you would like to serve, we could really use some help that way. We're not asking you to do everything, but we would really like to put together a team of people um, with a checklist just to kind of do some vacuuming, clean up some chairs. Um, and it doesn't have to be Sundays. It can be midweek or another day of the week. So if that's um, a way that you're interested in serving, if you guys um, could just come talk to me as soon as church is over and I'll get your contact information and we'll kind of continue to assemble a team. Or you can email us. Um, that's another good way to get in contact and we're gonna slowly put together a team. And even like today with the snow outside, um, that was a lot of snow, and we had some wonderful men out there trying to kind of clear up the parking lot, but there are needs that come up, and we would love to have a way to contact um, people to help out that way. So um, we'll put together a team with a checklist, a calendar, 
um, but we need bodies to help serve that way. So come talk to me if you'd like. And then um, also speaking of serving, um, have you guys noticed that we have a lot of kids here now? <laughs> We've really been growing in numbers with children. Um, and it's been our heart to, to launch our children's ministry again. And God was putting it on our heart back in December to really start moving in that direction. And some of our plans got shut down. Um, but it's been good. It's been good because it's making us think outside the box a little bit. And I'm so excited for the plans that we have coming up. Um, yeah, we really value the next generation, and Joel's going to be speaking on that a little bit more in the coming weeks, um, so stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, if you would like to be a part of that planning process or serve and come love the children on a Sunday morning, um, hopefully mid-March or end of March we'll start that. Um, again, you can talk to me. You can email the church. We're putting together a great team. Um, and again, this isn't saying you're stuck doing it forever. But if you'd like to find out more information, come talk to me and um, we're gonna have some meetings coming up and um, make a good plan of how we can love the children in this church and serve the families here effectively. So that's all from me. Are you guys ready for the word? I, I wanna personally thank those of you that helped this morning in clearing out the parking lot as much as we could uh, so that people can get in and out safely. Thank you very much for doing that. <clears throat> um, it, it really blesses my heart a lot to watch those of you who are being blessed coming back and saying, how can we be a blessing? Uh, because to me, when I see people not being a blessing, I take it as you're not being blessed. And you're still coming here two years later wondering if this is your church that you want to call home before you can put your hand on the gospel plow and not look back. Um, serving the kingdom of God doesn't necessarily mean getting up here and preaching. If that's your calling, that would great. Come talk to me and, you know, and we could talk about that. But serving God also is supporting the next generation, taking care of the upkeep, making sure that we're able to come together and meet without any hindrances. I mean, this morning, I almost had to, my wife was like, hey, we have to go get ice melt. I was like, Sunday morning, really? Ice melt? I'm going to really lead worship and preach and we're going to get ice melt. I don't want that to fall on my shoulders, not because it's, I'm too good for that. It's just that I'm sure there are other people where you can go get ice melt, right? So it's simple things like that when we talk about facilities upkeep. It's simple things like that that um, I would love to take off of my plate and my leadership's plate so that we can get things ready for us to come together uh, undivided in our attention to be able to serve you more faithfully. Make sense? I don't come across as a prideful pastor, right? It's like, that's beneath me. I'm not going to do that. In fact, uh, even with the children too, I've been praying and asking God for wisdom in, um, in how do we, because I don't like the way children's ministry is done in typical churches. It's just another glorified babysitting job. I don't want that. And so in a few weeks, you're going to hear from me. And I'm praying, I'm fasting and praying about this and actually sharing vision with you in why we want a, a generational ministry and how, um, and how you can play a part in that. Uh, I... I I told myself that I'm going to try and keep my messages concise and short because once we start the children's ministry, I've got to be able to end on time. So the children's ministry people, you know, we don't have them. They're like, yeah, I'm not going to do it next week because, you know, 15 hours later, they're still there trying to change a diaper and the kid is still screaming and crying. So uh, with that in mind, have your, uh, show grace towards me if I do go over because I want to talk about a topic that, like I said earlier, I've been in the furnace this week, um, not because of, uh, you know, a speeding ticket or you know, a sickness or anything like that. I've been in the furnace this week as I've been praying um, for the various glorified expressions of love that the world is celebrating today. That is flawed, that is wrong, and um, sadly that seeps into our churches and it seeps behind the pulpit and it begins to preach lies when the word of God is very clear about what is love, who is love, and how we ought to love. Let me... Um, take you back to um, a time when a family had love and care and joy and the, the, the old dad is sitting by his door watching his children come back after taking care of the animals that were grazing and, and he watches them afar and I'm quite sure that he, he had a sense of joy and excitement as he watched his generation, the children coming towards him with the flock and the blessings and the favor of God as they walk but his old eyes begins to count his children and as he begins to count, he sees that there's one missing. 
And he wrote it off as his, maybe his eyes are getting old and he didn't have glasses and you know, he didn't have vision coverage in his insurance. And then as they got closer, he began to count again and he realized there was a boy missing, a boy who had a coat of many colors that he himself made because he loved that child very much. And his heart begins to, to race. He begins to get more and more eager. And as they come close, he sees the coat this time, but it's not on the boy that he loves, but it's in his hand covered in blood. And the brothers present it to him and say, is this the coat of your son Joseph? It seems like to us that before he could get the lunch to us, a wild animal had him for lunch and we found only his coat that's covered in blood. What do you do when your heart aches? A broken heart just doesn't come when your girlfriend dumps you or cheats on you or your boyfriend runs away or your husband leaves you. A heartache comes when there's a loss of a loved one, when you're being lied to, when there's a collision between what you expected and what actually happens. I don't know, sitting in this room, we have a pile up, a wreckage, and your heart aches. What do you do when your heart aches? Like I said, today, all over social media and all around the world, you're going to have people posting pictures with filters on them and trying to present it as, look at our love life, see how loved I am. And then you're going to have other people that's going to be looking at this filtered picture that's not true and chase after poison wells and wonder why they're dying and what do I do when my heart aches? How do I deal with the brokenness that I face? How do I deal with the brokenness of my heart, the collision, the wreckage? Do we just duct tape it and walk away? BGs. This is why this church has a lot of gray hair because these are the kind of illustrations I use. BGs, you know? Ah, 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 staying alive. That was a good song, but they write a song called How Can You Mend a Broken Heart? I can think of younger days when living for my life was everything a man could want to do. Think about Jacob. Everything he wanted to do, man. He put his hand, he found favor. Wherever he went, his brother, he got the birthright and you know, the sheep, and he gets all the sheep that's, you know, colored differently and all that good stuff. I, I can think of younger days when living for my life was everything a man could want to do. I could never see tomorrow, but I was never told about the sorrows. I was never told about the heartaches. And then the chorus is a series of questions, and maybe you've asked these questions, and maybe you've gotten so sick and tired of asking these questions, you've stopped asking them. How can you mend a broken heart? How can you stop the rain from falling down? How can you stop the sun from shining? What makes the world go round? How can you mend this broken man? How can a loser ever win? Please, help me mend my broken heart. And let me live again. It says in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 37, verse 34, Then Jacob tore his garments, and he put on sackcloth, and he mourned for his son many days. All his children, all his sons, and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to the to Sheol, go down to the place of death, to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. How do you mend a broken heart? My heart aches. But you know what? Uh, spoiler alert Joseph wasn't really dead. His brother sold him away into slavery. While Joseph is weeping and mourning in sackcloth the death of his son, Joseph was not really dead. In fact, God was using Joseph to save the lives of millions. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you what? You turn it for good. You turn it to bring life and life in abundance. Jacob was, his name was Israel. And from there comes Moses and from there comes Yeshua, our Savior. It's so crazy. But Joseph wasn't really dead. But here... Jacob's mourning and grieving and it takes him nearly 23 years for him to finally see Joseph who's not dead and he rejoices at the fact and he says now I've seen my son and I can die in peace and some of us we want that I just want to see I want to see the promises of God fulfilled write down what are the breakthroughs you're praying for could it be that this is the day that God wants to bring an area in the breakthrough where you can say like Jacob now my eyes have seen that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? Um, you know, I ask myself this question. Why is it that every person who's lived a certain number of years, and those years get younger and younger, have you noticed? Sometimes when you look back, it took you till you were 18 and 19 for you to actually have a broken heart. And now, three-year-olds. Not because they're in a relationship with a girl, it's because the parents 
ditch and run away. And they leave the children with an aching heart. And you grow up with an aching heart and you wonder why is it that anyone who wants to be in this planet, on this earth, has to deal with a broken heart. Many people pull the cord and say, I'm done. I can't deal with this anymore. This is a very, very, very important subject for us to talk about, especially on a day like today. My heart aches. Is it because we're living in a, such a fast-paced world that we've refused to value human dignity and life that our heart aches? It's quite possibly true. But if that was the case, and if there was no need for us to go through a broken heart, if God doesn't have a plan in all of this, then it's kind of useless for us to come and talk about this at church. It can just become a philosophical topic that we can debate about over cigars and scotch. But I want to tell you this morning that even in your heart aches, God has answers in his word, and that should make you sit up and smile because I know some of you, you come here because you're hungry. You come here because you're broken. You come here because you're too scared to face the reality of your broken heart. And I want to tell you this morning that God has answers in his word. But I first want to introduce you to the damage that is done from a broken heart. A broken heart, like I said earlier, just doesn't come from a girlfriend that cheated on you, a husband that left you. A broken heart can come from a loved one that's being sick and you can't do anything about it. A few weeks ago when I was sick and coughing and couldn't breathe, I watched my wife just shed those tears. Her heart is broken and I watch her and my heart is broken. There's nothing that I can do. There's nothing that I can do. What do you do with an aching heart? And the damage that comes from a broken heart is this. Insecurity, shame, and fear. I didn't read this in a book. This is coming from the book of my own life that I've lived. Insecurity, shame, and fear. Like I said, it doesn't have to come from when your girlfriend ditched you, from when your husband left you. It can come from your parents leaving you when you were young. It can come from, please listen to me, and this is prophetic, I believe. It can come from when you were young and you had to act peacemaker to keep the peace between your dad and mom. And now you're old and you're married and you watch the same demons that haunted them haunts you and your heart is broken. You have an aching heart. And you're left with shame, insecurity, and fear. What does God, God's word have to say about this? And before we jump into scripture, I want you to know this and please write this down on a post-it note in your mirror and I want you to remember this. Satan will come to break your heart. Jesus comes to mend broken hearts. If you're here and you say, that's me, preacher. I have an aching heart. I want you to know Satan will come to crush you, to destroy you. But Jesus comes to mend you. And this morning, that's why I sang that for so many times. He is my healer. He is my provider. I want hell to know that he is my protector. No one can stand in the way when my God comes to rescue his child. No one, nothing, no past, no shame, no pain, no sin that's so great that he can stop and say, oh, wait a minute, you did what? I can't love you. I can't mend you. But my Savior, he's a healer. My Savior, he's my provider. My Savior is a mender of broken hearts. <laughs> I'm preaching better than you're responding this morning. I got to tell you that, man. <laughs> My heart aches when I see patterns coming back as an old familiar friend, and it says, sit down, let's talk. And it confronts me with my shame, my insecurities, my fear. And it doesn't go away. I only grow in my insecurities. I only grow in my shame. My heart aches when I lose confidence and security because the person I depend on has left me or let me down. This relationship, this marriage was not what I thought it was going to be. It was all great. It looked good on social media. We had a great 4K camera to capture the whole event. But the marriage is not really capturing what I expected. And there's a collision between my expectation and the reality. And now my heart aches. And there's no one I can talk to about because I chased after this and I cut people off. I chased after sex. I chased after this relationship. I chased after this marriage. I chased after children. And now... I'm hiding in shame and my insecurities. The problem then, folks, is not the pain of your aching heart. Please listen to me. This is the transition where we're actually going to build on. The problem is not the pain of your aching heart this morning. If I were you sitting there, I'm going to put my hand on my chest right now because I know my heart aches. And I'm going to tell myself in faith, the problem is not the pain I feel. The problem is what that pain brings. The problem, the real problem, is the loss of value the loss of purpose, the loss of meaning, the lies that Satan will use that pain to tell you that you're good for nothing, that you don't matter. The pain 
that comes from the hurting heart is not the problem. The problem is what that pain pushes you to do, pushes you to believe. God's word, it's like a strong, massive, powerful truck, truck, like a tow truck, that comes alongside when you've fallen in the ditch, overturned in the snow. I've been there before, I rolled my truck two years ago. It's crazy, it was stupid. I was doing 75 miles an hour on a freeway when it was snowing in two-wheel drive, didn't even bother putting in four-wheel drive. What an idiot, right? Well, I'm not from here, I don't know if you can tell. I learned my lesson though. I have PTSD whenever I drive in the snow and I'm like, you know, it's crazy. But I sat there, I'm telling you, it's so funny. I think I messed up in my head. I had frostbite on my toes because I was walking in the snow for about two hours. Got a massive ticket for that too, which is crazy, even though I didn't hit anybody. I'm standing there and I watch this tow truck. They strap it up. It's on its head, man. The power to drag a massive truck and put it back on its wheels. Woo! And I sat there, you know what the first thing I thought about? My God is stronger than that. I've watched myself wreck my life, topple, turn, frostbite, broken, totaled, good for nothing. And he comes, his word of God comes like a strong truck, latches onto you, pulls you back, puts you on the road. My truck was total, but for me, thank God, he looks at me and says, you're not total, I'm not gonna write you off. He puts me back on the road, and then with the lights flashing, he pilots me. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is my strength of who shall I be afraid? He goes before me. No enemy can stand in the way. I know what your heart is aching about. <coughs> but I want to confront the after effects of what that pain has caused you to feel and believe about yourself with the word of God that comes and drags you out from the ditch, puts you back on the road, onto your purpose, onto your calling, back to where you were before you experienced the pain of an aching heart. <coughs> Excuse me. Number one. Fear has no room in love. If you're writing down notes, I want you to write this down. Fear has no room in love. So when Satan comes and breaks your heart this week, when Satan comes and causes your heart to ache, you need to remember that Jesus came to mend broken hearts and fear has no room where there's perfect love. I'm sorry if I'm frightening your children. It's perfect love, I promise you. Heartaches bring fear and it stops you in your tracks. But when God's love is poured into your life, it has no room for fear. I completely forgot to do this, but I was wanting a picture of this with me, okay? Uh, I wanted to get a big glass bowl over here. And oftentimes we ask the question, is the glass half empty or half full? And I'm an idiot, and so I'm like, I don't care if it's half full or half empty. I'm like, why is it a glass and not a gallon? Right, I'm like, give me more, man. Like, whatever it is, I want more. Like, you know, why is it half full? But then I realized that even if the glass was fully empty, it's still full. It's full of air. It's full of something. And the only way you can get the air out is when you pour something in. And the Bible tells me that when God's love is poured in our life, when true, perfect love is poured into you, it has no room for fear. Wow. So the effects that come from an aching heart is fear. And God says, when I pour my love, that fear is gone. It's gone. Where did it go? I don't know. I was an insecure kid who couldn't smile in front of a camera. And now I'm preaching in front of like, I don't know how many cameras over here and goes around the world. What the heck happened? Well, Jesus' perfect love is what happened. I don't want to be insecure about how I look and who I am and what you think of me. My God says, I am free. So take a hike, Satan. You can break my heart all you want, but he will fix it, bro. He's my healer. <laughs> Someone needs to receive that word. First John chapter 4, verse 18. We're going to spend most of our time in that one verse. So you can turn over there and you can memorize it in the meantime. There is no fear in love. There's no it's not like a hint of it, a trace of it, a little bit, now and then, on Sundays, on Mondays, there is, tell, say with me, no fear in love. Once again, there is no fear in love. So right now, I'm preaching in faith. This is a prophetic preaching. If, you, you know, if you've spooked by it, I apologize. But like I said, I've spent time in the furnace this week, and I cannot stop myself from doing this, so forgive me. That's why I was leading worship like I don't care if my guitar breaks. That'll be like an offering to the Lord. And if I lose my voice, it's an offering to the Lord. I'll speak in sign language like... Uh, John the Baptist's dad did. <clears throat> you need to receive this. You come here with a broken heart. You come here with the insecurities. Quite possible you're not doing well in your job because of your aching heart and the effects of not the pain, but what the pain brought with it. It's friends. And you sit at home. And you watch others with confidence that are walking and you wonder how. You've seen friends who did the same stupid stuff that you did and you how. And we'll get to that, how the world mimics it. But today you can actually have authentic, genuine freedom. And I mean this in faith. This is a, 
this is, this is a living, active word that's going out from God's word. There is no fear in love. Amen. Because perfect love casts out fear. We'll talk about perfect love. How is it? How can we get it? In the second point. But for now, I want you to know that there's no fear in love. And then he explains why. Because fear has to do with punishment. Fear comes from the anxiety of punishment. Uh, I know I'm speaking to someone here this morning, and maybe each and every one of you. Oftentimes, we have to live in fear because you do not know when people are going to find out about what happened when you were 13 years old or 12 years old. And, and I've realized this is not necessarily about what you did. It could also be what was done against you. Your marriage is on rocky grounds even though you act like everything is fine because you worried your spouse will find out about what you did when you're 13 and 12. What you did two years ago, what you said at work. But the Bible tells me that perfect love will dispel and cast out fear because fear has to do with punishment. But whoever fears has not been perfected in love. When God pours out his love, there's no more, no more room for fear. Because fear comes from the anxiety of punishment. Many times we're too frightened to confront these patterns on choices that we make because of the shame of punishment that will come from it. Maybe in your relationships, in your marriage, you feel like, why can't we be best friends? Why can't we really be close? And it's possible because the aches and pains of your broken heart in the past is not letting you actually be who you are. It's made you someone that you're not because you're walking in the effects of pain. But perfect love will cast out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And perfect love does not bring punishment, but it'll bring correction out of care and love. And that's what Jesus does, doesn't he? Now, you can change your spouse. I'm unable to be one with you, so I'm going to go find somebody else. You can change your boyfriend. You can change your girlfriend. Hey, you can even change your parents these days. Do you know that? It was shocking when a kid was like, I don't want these parents anymore. I like my friend's parents, so I'm going to get them to adopt me. Crazy. What the kind of a world are we living in? But if you have not received the perfect love of God, wherever you go, it's going to be different faces, but the same fears and the same pains and the same insecurities and the same shame. Oh, what a timely message this is for the world right now. You're jumping from one thing to the next. You're jumping from one church to the next. But if you don't confront the aching heart that was legitimately something that you walked through, a broken heart, but if you're giving, giving room for Satan to continue to break your heart and not Jesus to heal your heart with his perfect love, you will always walk with a limp of insecurity, shame, and anxiety. I was about 11 or 12 years old. I keep forgetting the timeline. I need to ask my mother. But she's getting old, so she's forgetful too. I love you, Mom. No. <laughs> hey, in India, that's fine. Okay? It's like, oh, she's old enough to forget. She's lived a long life. God blessed her. You, know? you guys don't get it. It's like in India, being fat is a good thing. Hey, he eats well. You know, if you're being fair, it's a good thing. Here, you guys want to go tanned, like as if you're being fried in the sun. Anyways, you know, <laughs> those of you watching in India, I love you. Um, what was that? Yeah, 11 or 12 years old. And, <laughs> and, and um, did I did forget. I'm getting old. Thank you, Earl. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the gray-haired people have got my mom's back in this church. I like it. <laughs> Where are the young people? Come on, man. H hook a brother up. Get my back. No. <laughs> They're all like, I'm too insecure to say anything right now. My heart aches. I'm carrying fears from my past. Too soon. Okay. Sorry. God will heal you this morning. I promise you. I love you. No. Need more rock star. It's my leash. It keeps me on track. Okay. Jump back. I was about 11 or 12 years old. This is supposed to be a sad story. You guys are laughing at me. You guys suck. I was 11 or 12 years old. And, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, Everything was going fine in my life, really. Uh, my dad was my biggest hero. Every morning, I would polish his motorcycle with my brothers. I loved his motorcycle. He loved motorcycles. He loved karate and fitness. He was a fired up preacher. He was an amazing preacher. And uh, I still remember some of the sermons that he preached. In fact, sometimes, uh, you know, I wonder if I'll ever be like how amazing my dad was as a preacher. He was a very talented man, led worship, played instruments, played music and stuff like that. And I'm not saying this to, to tear him down, please, by no means. But when I was about 12 or 13 years old, 11, 12, 13, not around that age, I forget, um, my family began to split up. And even though you're young and you don't understand what's happening fully, you still deal with a broken heart. You still deal with the pains of the aftermath of what happened. And once again, I'm not saying this to tear my dad down. He and I are on good terms right now. I talk to him 
We pray together sometimes even, and I've forgiven him. I've let it go. <clears throat> but when you walk and live in an aching heart when you're young like that, I didn't realize it until I was about 30 years old, how much it brought insecurity, shame, and fear in my own life. And I had to confront it because I saw the same demons that was haunting me when I was a child, bringing me brokenness and pain entering into my home and into my marriage and into my intimacy, into my friendships. I couldn't lead the way I had to lead because I was leading out of insecurity, fear, and shame. I couldn't preach the way I preached because I was preaching out of insecurity, fear, and shame. I couldn't be transparent, authentic, and honest because I was worried, what if this pain comes back again? And when I was young, I tried different ways to cope with this. I tried different ways to be able to, to manage the brokenness. In India, unlike in Western cultures, it's a shameful thing when your dad leaves you. Because when a man leaves, the man is always right, the woman's always wrong, and it was always about the children. The children are drug addicts, the children are lazy, the children are used, the children are stupid. Parents in India take a lot of pride when the children do well in school. There's a huge price, a lot of suicide when they fail in the exam, when they don't get a good grade, they go kill themselves because they can't deal with the shame. And so I would lie to my friends and say, my dad's abroad. I would lie to my friends and say, my dad is dead. And oftentimes, my brother and I would talk and say, it would be better if he actually died than him, you know, leaving us and going away. It was a painful thing. And to cover this pain, to cover the shame, I found myself on the streets of India and I was homeless. I'd run away. Running away was my favorite thing to do. I'm always a runner, not like physical fitness. If I didn't like something, I would, I would just leave, go away. I would do my own thing. I would rather live out in the wild than have to put up with shame. And very soon I found myself with friends who tried to give me some sort of comfort and security. And the Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 24, one who has unreliable friends soon come to ruin. One who has unreliable friends will soon come to ruin. In other words, in our context today, one who chases after healing with unreliable sources will find themselves in ruin. And very soon I found myself in ruin. Nearly two years I was gone. No one knew where I was. I'm a, I'm a teenager, man. I'm like 13, 14 years old at this point. Peddling drugs in the, in the streets of India. Hanging out with people I shouldn't be hanging with. Much older than me. They would steal from me. I'll steal from them. We really didn't love each other, but we were just taking advantage of each other. And I soon found myself in ruin. But here, look at this. It says, but there is a friend. But there is a friend. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And this is not talking about David and Jonathan. This is not talking about Levi and Joel. This is not talking about George Sparks and Joel. This is not talking about Megan and Joel. This is talking about a man named Yeshua. His name is Jesus, who sticks closer than a brother. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You might have walked down the path of a broken heart and made choices because of your shame, your insecurities, and your fear. But I want to tell you this morning that there is a friend who will stick closer than a brother. And his love will dispel all fear. His love leaves no room for fear and brings absolute, complete, total healing. This morning, he's able to do that. David, David, he says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction. His tow truck came, wrapped me up, dragged me out from the ditch, picked me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. No more walking in insecurity and shame. No more walking in undecisiveness. My steps are secure. He put a new song in my mouth. Woo. A song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. This verse is being fulfilled in your hearing as I stand here and preach before you. This verse is fulfilled. This is what the Lord did in my life. This is my testimony. This is my story right here. And if you've been here in this church long enough, you've heard me say this multiple times. A hymn that really, you know, encapsulates my story is, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the seas, he heard my despairing cry, even though I couldn't put it into words. And from the waters, he lifted me. Now safe am I. And that's what David's writing about in Psalm chapter 40. Verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. God can heal you from your shame. He can heal you from your insecurity. He can heal you from your fears that comes 
from you being scarred because of an aching heart. But you have to let him pour out his perfect love in you that will cast out all fear. You have to let him do that. The word perfect, telos, teleos, used different ways. Almost fell off my chair when I saw this. Listen to me. What is perfect love? It's this. The word telos, perfect, is the same word that Jesus used on the cross when he says it's finished. Listen to me. When he said it's finished, he said it's perfected. It's done. It's over. His love is perfect. Please listen to me. This will change your life. This will change you completely, dramatically, supernaturally. How often do you lean on people? Do you lean on your spouse? Do you lean on your children for you to be complete? When Jesus says, it is completed, it's finished. My love will complete you, will complete you fully. You don't need this. You don't need that. You don't need this. You don't need to have a six pack. You don't need to have a hot wife. You don't have a hot husband or children or multiple partners. My love will complete you. It is telos. It's finished. It's over. My love will, will perfect you. You've been perfected in his love, but we let the world shape us and Satan sneaks in over there because it's the creep he is and he will break your heart, and Jesus says, I will come and mend your heart. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to move quickly because I'm trying to keep the time going too. Oh my God, I want to preach on that more though. Uh, maybe another week. Number two, counterfeit love. Counterfeit love will bring counterfeit joy. Counterfeit love will bring counterfeit joy. Um, only the things that are valuable is duplicated. You know, um, no one's going to duplicate a Walmart bag, like a plastic bag. You'd be like, mm, dude, you want some Walmart bags? Got 50 in my garage, man. I've been screen printing at home. Fantastic. No one can tell the difference. You'd be like, what's wrong with you, man? You've been to Oregon too long? Like, you know, what have you been smoking, you know? But you go into Walmart and you find all sorts of fake shoes over there. When Toms were big, fake Toms all over the place. It's crazy. I bought a pair. It didn't last two days. And I'm like, man, I mean, that was like the real Toms. They didn't last Anybody wore Toms? No, it was like the weirdest shoes, right? And then, okay, find Yeezys, right? Like, oh, yeah, Kanye West Yeezys. Expensive shoes all over Walmart. People will duplicate what is valuable. People will duplicate what is good. Now, if God's love is so amazing, if perfect love is so great, guess what? Satan will duplicate it too. And the world will duplicate it too. In fact, the reason why I'm preaching this message this morning is because my heart breaks every single year when the church and believers fall for this lie of misinterpreting what true love really is. Valentine's Day, I love you. Yeah, I love you. Well, you have no idea what love is. It's kind of sad. Your counterfeit joy will bring, counterfeit love will bring counterfeit joy. The world has its definition of love. It does. And I tried researching it this week so I could give it to you in one statement. And this is my statement. The world has various opposing views on the definition of love. Do you get that? It has opposing views. They have views. They have a definition, but it's opposing views. They cannot come to a, a decision of this is what love is. So they have views. I mean, the, oh, come on. The world always has an opinion, right? It doesn't mean that it's valuable or it's truthful. They have views on love, but it's always opposing views. And they have a target. And they want to hit the target. They say, that's what love is, and we want to hit it. But the target is always moving, and it's invisible. No one really knows what it is. No one, no one knows it. It's crazy. It, it, have you heard of Bigfoot? You have? Sasquatch. Sasquatch. There we go. I knew someone knew know the other name for it. See, I never heard of Bigfoot until I came to America. That tells me how weird you guys are, right? <laughs> oh, Bigfoot. I researched this this week. Spent far too long than I should have because I thought it was that weird and crazy. Dude, there are organizations that exist to educate people on Bigfoot. No one's ever seen this thing. They, 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 I think it was 2018, they had a two-day conference on educating people on big for two days. What did they talk about? I don't know. It's a mythical creature that people are chasing with cameras and organizing and training and, and invest, people are actually investing money. They have GoFundMe stuff for Bigfoot, man. I'm like, I want to get in on that action, right? <laughs> it's crazy. Sadly, as funny as that is, that's what love is to the world. It's a mystery that they chase. And they have pictures to prove that someone spotted it, that someone has it. Oh no, but we're Hollywood celebrities. We've been together 38 years. We have children together. Please listen to me. What they have is a relationship. They don't have love. What they have is a partnership. They don't have love. 
I can do business with a person for 38 years but not have love. Partnership like that is not what biblical relationship is all about. Counterfeit love will produce counterfeit joy. Oftentimes, we're okay with counterfeit joy. We let it go, and because of that, we forfeit the perfect love that casts out all fear. So we will embrace counterfeit joy, and we will keep on trying to put away that shame, that insecurity and fear, and you might have a long life, but you've never lived with one day in your life. <clears throat> Look at God's word. It says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Can we say it together? God is love. One more time. God is love. Now we sound like a Catholic church or Catholic school. God is love. Say it again. Louder. God is love. Well, you're getting whacked in your hand, right? No. Sorry, Catholics. I love you too. And so does Jesus. God is love. Believers, you and I have a great advantage. People who don't believe, they don't have access to perfect love. Because God is love. We have access to perfect, unadulterated love. God is love, but this does not mean that love is God. Okay? I know, I know this is there's a lot that I'm going through. It's like, write it down, go back home, chew on it. Um, just because God is love does not mean that love is God. And this is important for you to note because it's God who defines love. Love does not define God. In the world we live in, in the churches that, we, that are open, that has thousands of people, they let love define God, not God define love. This is how crazy it is. Because in the world, they will say, love is sex. And so what becomes a God? Sex becomes a God. And so they will spend money, they will cut away friends, they will cut away relationships to go after their God. Okay, controversial. Sexuality, my sexual identity is love. And so they will chase after that. They will cut off family, cut off friends, and that becomes a God. Love does not define your God, but God is the one that should define love. Let's bring it to the church. We oftentimes think that love is getting married, having children. And you chase after that. You don't seek God. You don't ask God. You don't seek God. Has your perfect love perfected in me? Am I carrying scars of my past because I'm going to carry scars into what you want to bless me? It's new wine, old wine skin. It's going to go kaboom. No, you don't want to do that because that becomes your God. And you say, I'm going to chase after that. And yeah, sure, you got a blanket of God. You got all the right words going on. But you're now leaning on your spouse and putting her or him in the place of God, asking that person to perfect you and to cast out fear when they are mere human beings who cannot do that. You haven't been to God. You haven't confronted these things, your aching heart, and now you're left with another ache, another pain, and you wonder, where's God? I trusted him in all of this. Sure, you sang, you jumped, you preached, you wrote songs, and you participated in the church, you served in children, you shoveled the snow and all of the good stuff, but you didn't confront your aching heart and say, God, your love needs to perfect me before I go in this direction, before I start making this my God, before I start pursuing this like as if this is what I have to do. I need to get my claws on this and I'm going to, like, you know, with the vigor. And you let those things define who God is and not God define what love is. Jesus defines love so perfectly. And this is something that really kind of makes me twitch a little bit in my seat when I hear preachers do this. Every single wedding, man, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love is patient and love is kind. I'm sorry if you had this in your wedding. I love you. But... It just kind of gets a little redundant, you know? And then worst of all, they'd be like, you need to put your name over there. Joel is kind. Joel is patient. I'm like, bro, do you know me? <laughs> you mad? Like, seriously? Wow, how brainwashed are you? Dude, I'm a miserable human being. I am not patient. I am not kind. But I'll tell you who is. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. He does not envy. He does not boast. He's not arrogant. He's not rude. I am. He is he doesn't insist on his own way. When he came into the world, he says, I only do what the Father sent me to do. I can call on angels and have your backsides beaten. No, I'm only going to do what the Father came to, sent me to do. He's not irritable. He's not resentful. He does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but he rejoices with the truth. He bears all things. He believes all things. He hopes all things, and he endures all things. He is the perfect embodiment of love. 
here are things that I've been worshiping in my own personal life at how good and awesome God is. God's love is sacrificial. Listen, at this point, I'm trying to convince you from God's word to let go of your idols, to let go of your heartaches that you've been chasing after and the, and the means you're trying to find healing. I'm, I'm, I'm urging you, I'm begging and pleading with you with the mercy of God to let go. Even if it's the spouse you've been leading, I'm not saying dump your spouse, but I'm saying stop putting that place in the place of God and go to Jesus for your healing. Don't, don't worship your children to find a sense of I belong, but let go. Let go and hold on to God because listen, his love is sacrificial. It says, but God showed his love for us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why do you want to worship idols? Why do you want to worship the blessing than the giver of blessing? His love is sacrificial. He's willing to continuously, continuously forgive you, forgive you, forgive you because his love was sacrificed and he loved you while you were still in your sin. Even before you came here this morning, before a realization of the idols that you've been worshiping, even though you're a blood-bought saint, child of God, you've been worshiping the puke of the world and Jesus still loves you. His love is sacrificial. Look at this. His love is selfless. Your spouse cannot love you this way. Your children cannot love you this way. Your dog or your cat cannot love you this way. His love is selfless. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave. For God so loved the world that he gave. Listen to me. He did not lend himself to you. He gave himself to you. He did not loan himself to you. He gave himself to you. He didn't say, hey, listen, man, I'll pick you out now and then you got to figure it out because listen, I got stuff to do, man. I, I, this new game, Halo, has come out. I just want to go check it out. Your husband will do that, sadly. gave no one can love you this way yes there's counterfeit love yes there's counterfeit love but you'll only have counterfeit joy it will not last you you can walk down that aisle a million times with 50,000 people different from you different from your previous spouse you will never find joy and contentment and purpose and meaning until you walked to the cross where Jesus died for you experience his sacrificial love his giving love his selfless love he gave himself to you why would you ditch him and run after other ways to heal yourself from pain and insecurity his love gives for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever whatever you've done wherever you are will believe in him will trust this words that's coming from the word of God that's alive and active. Believe it. Jesus, heal my aching heart. Dear God, I'm an insecure person. I've been walking in the, in the shadows of who you created me to be. I'm ready to come out to the light. Show me the areas where I fail. Heal me from this. Call me back to my purpose, Lord. Put me back on the playing field where I need to be. That whoever will believe in him will not perish but will have eternal life. Are you dying in your aching heart? You don't have to die anymore. You might be old, you might be young, you might kick the bucket this week, but this one week you can live finally for who God made you to be. His love is patient. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Every time I read this verse, I cannot fail but tell you, it's quite possible that you're still breathing and alive and active because God is patient towards you. He's patient towards you. So many times he should have struck you dead. There were twice in my life when I actually prayed this, I said, Lord, step aside. I want to indulge in this sin, leave me alone. That's Romans chapter one. And God gave me into the desires of my heart. My God, what a patient God he is. I dare you to do that with your spouse. Don't do it, please. And then blame me. <laughs> Pastor told me to do it. And even if you're able to be, I know there are marriages over here that have been reconciled beautifully, beautifully reconciled after all the sin and shame that we've indulged in. But even in those areas, don't let Satan continue to break you down with shame, insecurity, and fear. Let his perfect love heal you because God is patient towards you. We cannot be patient to let all the time, even with the person you love the most, even with your children, even with your children. Mothers, don't leave me hanging. Stop that! I'm sick and tired of this. And then I come home and there's tears and there's like weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. I'm like, hey, I was studying about hell and wow, thank you, Lord. Great illustration. I'm kidding. It's not that bad. It's worse. No. <laughs> not because of my kids, because we have two cats. And <laughs> get that cat off my chair. No, I love them. I'm growing to love them. <laughs> God's love is forgiving, it's forgetting, and it's cleansing. 
It forgives you. Hey, do you know those times when you're having a great time in life? You're having a fantastic time, and all of a sudden, something from your past hits you. And you sit there with a sour look on your face, and you feel condemned, and no one said a word. But it just comes back, it wells up. A song captures it really well. It says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, what do you do? And your heart begins to ache. And it's not really the pain that's a problem. Like I said, it's the shame, the insecurity, the fear. And then you cripple yourself. And you say, I gotta leave. I gotta leave. I, I can't stay too long. I gotta leave. And you've been leaving, and you've been leaving, and you've been leaving, and you really haven't been able to experience the blessing that God's put around you because you keep remembering your sin. And this morning, I want to tell you perfect love will cast out fear because his love forgives and his love forgets. Let me give you scripture. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 25 says, I am he. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. He doesn't forgive you because of the way you repented, of the tears you shed. He doesn't forgive you because he waited and watched and for two months you've done okay. He says, oh, okay, fine, I'll forgive you. No, he forgives you for his own sake because he is a perfect God. He is love. He's a God that doesn't keep a record of your wrongdoings. He blots out your transgression for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Can I hear an amen for that? Yeah. I will not remember your sins. Joel, I look at you and the way I created you. I'm not going to remember your sins. I love you, man. Dude, what are you doing? Why are you going back to your past? Come on, I picked you up. You're not in the ditch anymore. You're on the road. Look at where you're going. Dude, I'm calling you to be a pastor. I'm calling to write worship songs. I'm calling to write powerful messages every week. Don't live in the ditch. I've forgotten it. I've forgiven you. Come on. You're good terms with me. And when you do fail, I will discipline you because I love you. God's love saves you. It cares for you and it cleanses you. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says, He saved us not because of the righteous things we have done. Thank you, Jesus. Not because of Oh, I haven't done that in three months, you know. Like, oh man, I, I was 13 years old and then, you know, I was, I've never, checked, I would never do that. Kaz, like, who's this jackass, right? Sorry, who's this clown, joker? That's what I meant to say. Thank God he doesn't save me because of the words I say or don't say. He doesn't save me because of the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, like we sang last week. Walk and wash away my sins, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This phrase has been coming back to me this week. What can make me whole again? What can make me complete again? Not my spouse, not my children, not a church, not a calling, but the blood of Jesus, the love of Jesus that was shown for me that freely gives himself. Washed away our sins, giving us a new birth, a new life through the Holy Spirit. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. That's what we're going to be talking about. A broken heart can be born again, can be made whole again. That's, that, that's right there. That's it. How can I get this perfect love to be born again? How beautiful to have a fresh start. How beautiful to, to wake up and to say, okay, I mean, wake up not when you go home and sleep, but you're sleeping now, wake up, okay? Like your heart's asleep and you wake up and you say, I want a fresh start. I, I don't want to live in the scars of my childhood and the scars of what my dad said to me, my mom did to me, my neighbor said to me, the way that I was abused, the way that boy did this, the choices I made running from pillar to post, trying to find contentment and satisfaction, trying to find joy, but it was all counterfeit all gone. He's forgiven. He's forgotten. Thank you, Jesus. And now I want to be born again. Now, you might have given your life to Christ 18 years ago, 25 years ago, but this morning I'm calling you to be born again in this area of bringing your broken heart to Him, recognizing I see the problem was not the pain. The problem was all this junk that came in. And I've never been able to be authentic with myself and with others, and especially in the calling that you created me for. I want to be born again. I want to be born again this morning. Those of you watching at home, you need to be born again this morning. You need to say, Lord, I'm done. I'm done searching for counterfeit joy. I'm done searching for counterfeit love to lean on. I'm going to lean on Jesus Christ. I'm going to lean on you, your perfect love. Let it invade me. Let it fight the war within me, and we know that you always win. Let it fight this past sins. Let it fight this past memories. Let it fight in the areas of my mind where Satan is taking control. Fight it, Lord, and let your perfect love be poured into me and fear you can be gone dispel, run away. He's the perfect embodiment of love. And these are just a few examples and illustrations of perfect love. No one else can love you this way. And you can have this if you're born again. There is a requirement, however. There's a requirement. There's always got to be a catch, right? So crazy, even in church. Third one. 
We're doing well on time. There's a third one. A broken heart is a requirement for love to be perfected. So if you're coming with a broken heart, I want to encourage you. A broken heart is a requirement for love to be perfected. And let me explain this. In fact, you know what? Can I do this real quick? Because... I just don't want to have the joy of standing up here and saying, man, I deal with a broken heart and it's great to be born again. Wherever you are, would you put your hands up if you deal with a broken heart, an aching heart, and you want God to heal you this morning? Just put your hands up. Thank you. Thank you. What a joy. What a joy. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Okay. I'm not just preaching to dead people over here. I'm preaching to people who want to be alive. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. Thank you. David was a very powerful king, and you can read about this in 2 Samuel chapter 11. He was a very powerful king. He found his purpose. He found his meaning. He was respected. He was one of the greatest kings that Israel has ever seen, the world has ever seen. King David, Malak David. He was anointed, George. (laughs) Thank you. I told George, I will talk about David this morning, because we met, and the Holy Spirit was doing something in him about David, and I did not know if I would actually, and I was like, here we go, perfect. Ties this up really well. He was a powerful king. And he was very well respected. And it says in Second Samuel, Second Samuel, Samuel. It's my Hebrew and my English and my Indian all mixing together. <laughs> Shamuel. Second Samuel chapter eleven. It says it was time for kings to go to war, and David is on the rooftop having a very different war that he's fighting. He's fighting the war of chasing counterfeit love for counterfeit joy. It was the time for kings to go to war. And he's not out there fighting the Philistines or the Amorites. He's fighting a much greater war within himself. It's not like he had a broken heart. Oh boy, but he was setting himself up for a broken heart that will bring fear, anxiety, and shame. He uses his authority to send for the woman who was bathing. Her name, surprisingly, is Bathsheba, who was having a bath. And he brings her, and he has his way with her. And he feels like I've experienced satisfaction, joy, and contentment. But I told you, counterfeit joy, counterfeit love will only produce counterfeit joy. And the joy is very short-lived when fear, shame, and insecurity come knocking on the door with a message that says, hey, that woman you had your way with, she's prego. She's pregnant. Do you see what I've been saying? You chase the world for counterfeit love and you will find counterfeit joy, and it will leave you in fear, in shame, and in insecurity. What does he do to cover this up? He walks in fear. He acts in insecurity. And he brings shame on his leadership. He sends a message to bring the husband. His name is Uriah. Every time I talk about this, I want to mention his name, and I'll tell you why. He calls for Uriah. And he tries to coax Uriah to pawn this pregnancy onto him, but Uriah is a faithful, 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 faithful soldier. And David does the ultimate act of fear, and he murders the person that he's frightened of. And who is he frightened of? His faithful, loyal soldier. David went and brought on a giant. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine who will speak against the name of Yeshua, our Lord? And he brings him down. But here is a faithful soldier who's serving him. And like a coward, he doesn't even do it himself. He puts him in the front of the battle and has the enemies kill him. Satan will come to break your heart. Watch out. Jesus will come to mend your heart. Embrace him. Not too long, David is confronted with the reality of an aching heart. He's on the floor with tears and fasting because the child that Bathsheba was pregnant with is born now and is dying. How do you deal with an aching heart? David's on the floor. God loves him and God loves you and just like he sent me to talk to you, God sent Nathan to talk to David. And and Nathan shares a story with David and says, hey, you've sinned against God. And David, it says immediately he repents and he says, I've sinned against God and I've done what's wrong, and Nathan turns around and says, and God has forgiven you your sins. Repentance, I've told you this many times, repentance will bring immediate forgiveness, immediate restoration to your calling. I'm I'm not joking about this. I'm very serious about this. Sometimes 
to play it safe, we say you have to still deal with the consequences of your actions, but I'm here to tell you that my God is so big that genuine repentance, God is able, and I've seen him do it, even remove the consequences of your stupid actions. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. Bathsheba's son, Solomon, became the next king of Israel, the wisest man who ever lived apart from Jesus. We just did a series from the writings that he wrote from the book of Ecclesiastes. David repents. What does he do with his aching heart? He takes it to God. He realizes that this love is not going to fulfill him. The kingdom of being a king is not going to fulfill him. Having this child live is not going to fulfill him. There's only one that can complete him. There's only one that can heal him. There's only one that can cast out the fear, the shame, and the anxieties. And he had to come clean before him. You have to come clean before God in repentance. The requirement is a broken heart. And the choice that you have this morning is you can leave these doors with a broken heart that Satan has broken because of your past actions of sin or your heart can be broken before God in repentance. And when you break your heart before God in repentance, he will heal you, restore you immediately. This is what the word of God says in the book of Psalm chapter 57, verse 16. You do not delight in sacrifices. And by the way, David wrote the Psalm after the fact of what we spoke about. You do not delight in sacrifices or I'd bring it. God, if you wanted me to write out all my savings in a check and put it in the church, I will do it, fine. But that's not what you want. You take no pleasure in burnt offerings. You can, you can go to the various ends of the world as a missionary. American churches, this is what we depend on, isn't it? Oh no, but I serve here. I went there. I was a missionary here. I did this. I did that. You know how much I tied to the church. I played for that. I, I, I support this ministry. I write checks over here. God does not care. The main thing he cares about is this. He does not care about your side. The sacrifices of God is a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. It's quite possible that you've come in with your pride and your arrogance still feeling like you can doctor yourself back to health. This woman will heal you back to health. This marriage will heal you back to health. No, it will not. In fact, it's only taking you away from God. A new house, a new car, a new motorcycle, a new church, a new pastor, a new hairstyle, new clothes. Counterfeit love will produce counterfeit joy. It will last for a moment, a year or two. It will leave you with an aching heart. What are you going to do? You can have a broken spirit this morning, a broken heart this morning before God and say, God, I've run away from you. I've walked away from you. I have tried to doctor myself, but you are my healer. I've tried to restore myself, but you are my redeemer. I've tried to pick myself up, but you are my savior. And I'm coming back to you. I want to have a broken heart, Lord. Of all the things, even the things that I've gotten over, but I've never confessed them to you. I've never confessed them to you. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, come let's reason, says the Lord. Come let's reason, let's talk about this. Let's sit down, here, have a drink, let's talk. Let's reason, says the Lord. Though your sin be as scarlet, I will make it as white as snow. When you go out there, you see the snow? The pure, beautiful snow that falls, that's white. He says, I will cleanse you that way. You're scarred, you're marred, you, you look like my shirt. And I will make you white as snow. I will cleanse you completely, I'll forget your sins, I will forgive your sins. What a joy for our hearts to be restored. I really don't care about Valentine's Day. What I care about is if we really have come to him with our brokenness in our hearts or are we duct taping the crap out of the broken bowls that we are and completely lost the intricate designs that God has created you with. Sure, you can scoop water now because there's no cracks in you, but maybe you were never created to scoop water. Maybe you were created to put on a shelf for it to be admired with the gold inlays on you with all the cracks and the scars and the brokenness. But no, you want to duct tape yourself so you could be used to scoop water. God says, no, the only way you can find purpose and meaning is if you come to me. Let me show you the beauty that you are. Let me show you what I created you for. All these past hurts, bring it to me. I will heal you. Don't run after these things. Stop relying on your spouse. Stop relying on your children. They are not God. He is God. He is God. It's easy for us to find ourselves worshiping idols, even in church, running after the likes of Hollywood wannabes and trying to be more like them, flaunting our success on social media when deep inside we're broken, miserable, bankrupt people. It's okay if the world doesn't recognize what God has done in your life. When you breathe your last, I want you to know that you lived completely in the love of your Savior. 
We're going to close. Give me five minutes. <clears throat> I was in the streets in India. And I would cry. I would cry for hours on end. I would cry in loneliness. And even when I wanted to be in a relationship, now I'm old enough to want to be in a relationship. Now I'm able to put it into words. Apparently I had abandonment issues. Abandonment issues. If you love me, how long are you going to stay? If my own dad could leave me and walk away, how long would you stay? And so because of that fear, I'm always waiting for that person to leave. Never trusting a word that comes out of this person's mouth. And then that builds anger. Because anger is a secondary emotion. It's trying to hide the shame. It's trying to hide the fear. And so what do I do? I was a very violent person. Extremely violent person. And at one point I decided that there's no way I can be in a relationship because I am just I already have anger issues. I'm very short tempered. And then to throw in the fact of my abandonment issues that comes from this heartache, there's no way I can I can so I, I, I keep people at an arm's length because I'm too scared to get close to them. Some of you are like, oh, that's why he hasn't returned my calls. No, that's different. <laughs> you're not my boyfriend, you're not my girlfriend, you're not my wife. Knock it off. Okay? <laughs> no. I could never trust a person. I could never trust people. I always would keep people at an arm's length. And even those that came close to me, I would warn them. I would blow up any minute. You'd never know what you're going to get. I ran into this Australian missionary. True story, I only hung with him because he had beautiful daughters, okay? And no, you don't find that funny. You're like, Joel, you're old now, you're married, you cannot talk about that. Listen, I'm not shamed about that. See, Jesus forgive me from all of that. And so it's fine. But I would go there, but God takes what the enemy meant for evil and turns it to good. I started more than observing the girls, I was observing this man, his name was Mark Fisher. He was a very different believer. He was a very different Christian. I'd never seen a Christian like him before. This dude, like me, had anger issues. By the way, even if you're a saint, you go to India, you're gonna have anger issues, okay? I think that's why Jesus didn't go to India. When people say, no, Jesus went to India, I'm like, no way, dude, he would have sinned, okay? <laughs> I, I bet those who are watching in India are like, true, bro, <laughs> you know? <laughs> the cows, the buffaloes, the politicians, and all the other wars that's going on, and no rules, no laws, and you get fined for God knows what. And uh, this guy was just mad all the time. But you know what? There were three things I always watched him do. He was always praying. I'm not joking, he was always praying. He'd walk around the garden, he'd be praying. He'd be cleaning his house, he'd be praying. He'd be praying in tongues. He'd be singing songs. He'd be walking on the rooftop, say, I grew up Baptist, so tongues to me was like, nah, excuse me, bro, like, you know, I think you're trying to speak Indian, you're getting it wrong, right? <laughs> and he'd always pray, or he'd be talking to his family. And whenever he talked to his family, he'd be telling them something that God is teaching him in the Word, that God's teaching him in the Spirit. And the third thing he would do is he was always evangelizing, all the time. It got me noticing, I was like, who is this guy, and what is his problem? Long, long story short, that was the place I gave my life to Christ. It was one Sunday morning, it was a home church, and they were singing, my Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. And his name for the first time rang in my spirit. For the first time, I felt the mountains bow down, the mountains of fear, insecurity, and shame. And I'm not even joking, it was a split second. It was a split second, and I sense it in my spirit even now as I speak. For the first time in my life, all the hurt and pain that came from my dad, I'm not joking, it rolled away from me. And the first thing that came to my mind was my poor dad, I hope he's experienced this kind of joy I'm experiencing right now, this freedom, oh my God, he is a human being like me and he needs Jesus too. That's what came to my mind. I mean, I couldn't put it in words because it was such a joy in my spirit. And I sat there and I didn't say anything. And I'm sitting there and, and we were done church and we had food and I'm just sitting there and I'm unable to move and he comes to me about three hours later and he says, are you, what's going on? I said, I need to talk to you. I said, something happened when we're singing that song. The power in the name of Jesus was, was something that was a reality. Mountains bow down, seas will roar at the sound of his name. And, and, and it was a week when, like how we have all the snow, it said there was a gust of, that was like tornadoes hitting that place. We were very close to the beach. And you can hear this sound of wind, mighty rushing wind. It was like the Pentecost was great. Next week I was baptized. And I was the first person that he baptized in India. And he risked his life because there's an anti-conversion law. You cannot just convert people that can baptize people, especially when you're a foreigner. He said, I'm willing to die for this. We're going to baptize you, put you in the water, and lift you up. Did I struggle after that? Absolutely I did. But you know what? I'd never cried after that in my insecurity and my shame. 
When I cried, I cried tears of joy, knowing that there's a God who loves me, even if my father and mother don't. There's a God who loves me, even if this girl doesn't want to have a relationship with me, or be with me, or seen with me. There's a God who loves me, even though I feel like I'm ugly. He fearfully and wonderfully made me. And then it was a matter of day by day being patient with him, in his presence, not with him, patient with his plan for my life. Patient, not knowing what was going to happen. And the breaking point came actually not too long ago. It was about 10 years ago when I moved to the States. I was married. Fear, shame, insecurity. I have this person in my life who's from a very different culture from me, upbringing different from me. I have no friends, no one even knows if I speak English because I look like a foreigner. And, 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 and I was called Jonathan's brother. People even didn't know my name. They called me my brother's name. You're Jonathan's brother. You're Jonathan's brother. You're Jonathan's brother. I'm sick and tired of it. No, I'm Joel. I have a calling. I have a purpose. Her friends are my friends. The restaurant she likes to is the restaurant that I'm forced to go to. <laughs> and I'm having to lean on this person. And Satan comes back to break your heart and to say, fear insecurity and shame will come knocking on your door. Who are you now, Joel? Who are you now? You're nobody now. You thought all of that was healing that God brought? No, it was just a, it was just a temporary thing. It was just a time being thing. It was just a season in your life. Forget about it. Get, give in to anger. Give in to frustration. Give in to insecurity. Show her who's boss. Be dominant. And I started noticing this problem, this sin of fit of rage come back. I had to take it to him beautiful, beautiful breakthrough. My wife and I, we sat down and I said, hey, I need to be honest with you. I'm having a problem with anger. And this was about 10, 15 years, 11 years ago, no, nine years ago. I have a problem. And I said, it comes from this. It comes from the insecurity that's been just put on me over and over and over again. And next time I'm angry, don't, 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 don't try to fix me. Because it's not, it's not a personality thing. It's a sinful thing. I said, just pray for me, please. Don't be like, I'm going to pray for you in the name of Jesus. I'm like, <laughs> no. Just go pray for me. Just please just pray for me. And you know what? That is an illustration of how I'm not depending on her to fix me. We're going to him. We're going to him. I'm going to go to him. I recognize my need for him. And, and she is not trying to be like, why are you so mad at me? And feeling insecure, she knows that there is a Savior who can heal us. There is a Savior who can fix us. Oftentimes we try to fix each other because we're trying to be each other's savior. And Satan looks at it as a beautiful opportunity to bring past hurt, to break your heart. But when you go to him, he mends broken hearts. Would you please stand, we'll pray. My Jesus, my savior, Lord, there is none like you. I thank you, Lord, for the mountains that you're showing us in our lives that need to bow down this morning at the sound of your name. Let it bow down, Lord. Let it surrender to you. <laughs> Thank you. We give you glory this morning. We give you it's the weight and honor that you deserve. We give you, we give you, we give you, we give you glory. We give you glory by giving you our pain, our aching hearts as a sweet aroma offering to you, asking you to forgive us for the times when we've tried to be our own doctors for healing ourselves, when you are our healer. We give you, we give you, we give it to 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 you. And right now, in this room, O oh King, I pray for the broken hearts that are struggling, mm, that are frightened, that are assigning their hardships and suffering to the wicked and evil things they've done in the past. We know that you're a God who's faithful, who's loving, who's able to forgive. I pray for those who are walking through the valley of the shadow of death as a part of life, not as an act of sin. Father, I pray that you will save them from the lies of the enemy, from the condemnation of the enemy. I pray for those who are sick and who are really guilty right now, wondering if their sickness is from the sinful actions of their past. I want you to know, those of you who are in your, in your, in your sick bed right now, the doctors are unable to find a cure. Come to Jesus. Give him your broken heart. Please give him your broken heart. Give him your broken heart. Stop assigning blame to your life. That's 
what Satan does. Your job is to come to Jesus. Would you come to him now? Come to him now, right now. Come to him now. Say, Father, forgive me. Forgive me. I'm giving you, I'm giving you my hurt. I'm giving you my pain. I'm giving you all my shame. I'm giving you my past. I'm giving you my teenage years. I'm giving you that, that time when I was four years old. And this person did this thing to me. I'm giving it to you, Lord. I'm no longer, no longer going to hold on to it. I'm not going to let the after effects of what happened dictate to me now who I should be. You're not an object. You're not just a piece of meat. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You might not have grown up with a dad or a mom or a family that doesn't negate you from being able to be a dad or a mom or have a family. You might have lost a loved one not too long ago and you're going to go back home to that empty seat during dinner time. It doesn't negate the fact that God is with you and His perfect love will cast out fear but will instead bring joy knowing that one day we will spend eternity with Him and our loved ones. Father, I pray in faith now what you asked me to pray. You gave it to me so well, O oh Lord, when I was sitting in your presence, this message. And I pray now as I delivered it that you would weed out the things that was in the flesh and elevate and bring to life the things that were in the spirit. Father, you asked me to pray for a breakthrough. You asked me to preach like these words were alive that would truly bring change. And I pray that that will happen now in Jesus' name. That the chains would fall, that blind eyes will see, that broken hearts will be mended, that stony hearts will be turned to flesh, that you will sprinkle your water and cleanse us from all our past unrighteousness and sin. That today, as we go out in the world and we see these posts on social media and billboards and sales on hearts and love, we would smile to ourselves and say, I found a love greater than life itself. I found him. His name is Jesus. He is love. He is the embodiment of love. He is the description and the example and the perfect illustration of love. I'll walk with him. I'll walk with him. Take the whole world. Give me Jesus. Take the whole world. Give me Jesus. The, the world behind me, the cross before me. Would you make that your prayer this morning, please? Say, Lord, I want to be born again. Lord, I want to be born again. Even, even if you're watching us at home, please pray this. Lord, I want to be born again, Lord. Lord, God, heal my broken heart. God, make me whole again. Father, I pray in faith against the consequences of our stupid actions, the consequences that came from hurt and shame and fear. I pray for tears of joy all over the place, wherever this message is being heard. I pray for joy that comes from freedom in the presence of Jesus. Father, I pray that you will cause us to rejoice, that the world will think, what is wrong with you? Are you stupid? See what's happening because of your stupid choices, but we will rejoice knowing that I found a love. I found a love. I found fathers that have lost their children, spouses that have lost their loved ones, grandparents that have lost time with their grandchildren. Rejoice this morning, for there is a God who will forgive you, who will forget your sins, and who will restore you. If you have life this morning, He's still giving you time. He will mend your broken heart and make you whole again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the beautiful, powerful working of the Holy Spirit Woohoo, yeah, receive it, man. Receive the power of the, of the Holy Spirit. Receive his anointing. Receive his infilling. Receive his gifting. Take it in. Rejoice in it. Drink it up. Let it pour out into your life and cast out fear now. In the name of Jesus and the church said, amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. God bless you guys. God bless you. Thank you, thank you.